Thank you very much. Um, since we're all here in this beautiful state of California, I think you would find it very easy to remember my name. Andreas is just like the San Andreas fault, but it's not my fault. And uh, Rick did like the earthquake scale, and it's not my scale either, and I don't even think there's a relation there. And so if you would find a geological explanation for Kurt, I would very much appreciate so I can complete the story. <laughs> Kurt? Yeah? Oh, like Kurt. Like yeah. Well, maybe, but the, the initial letter is wrong, so yeah, yeah. And since I'm supposed to start with a joke, um, one that you probably all will uh, appreciate. Uh, do you know the difference between Reno and Washington, D.C.? No? Well, in Reno, the drunks are gambling with their own money. <laughs> All right, so uh, I, w I would like to share with you how I came to uh, be associated with the uh, Geet Company and uh, the few things that I had done. So let me first get into my own background and how I came to get there. My, I, I'm not sure if that helps you any, but it makes me feel warm and fuzzy that I'm doing the right thing. So uh, <laughs> we'll go on this way. Uh, my expertise is, is uh, modern optics, in other words, laser optics, uh, electrical engineering, uh, and physics, and of course, if you do theoretical work in these three fields, you can't help it but be fairly good at mathematics too. I have come up pretty much through the ranks of the professions, if you wish to say so, um, I've started as an electrician doing really dirty work on construction sites. Uh, I have had several years of industrial design experience. I have done research for many years. Uh, the regular government approved stuff, etc., with Navy funding, etc. And in the last couple of years, I have done uh, lecturing in uh, community colleges uh, and universities. So up to this point, I have been very much what Molly Pantone uh, a few days or a few years ago has called a bookhead. Uh, yes, I was a bookhead, or back home we call them bookworms, one who will crunch through books one after another, most of them being of scientific uh, or technical nature. Now, in the 80s, there has been a lot of spiritual activity going on, and you may have heard of uh, Ramsa. Um, that was a, an entity, uh, supposedly a 35,000-year-old warrior that channeled through a lady in Yelm and uh, I uh, visited here quite regularly. And I remember in one uh, private session, Ramsa gave me all sorts of advice and made me compliments that I hardly ever thought I would hear, especially from uh, a spiritual teacher. And so when Paul Pantone one day uh, went to, to the office of that community, and he wanted some scientist uh, or engineer who could help him out. They said, oh, we don't do anything like this. Um, but here's this guy, he's in, he's in Seattle, and uh, why don't you contact him? So Paul uh, called me, and that was about 86 or so, and um, we have been in contact ever since. Uh, I remember his call, he, he told me that he had an engine, and fortunately, uh, this channeled entity, Ramsa, had warned me 
uh, that there are lots of things uh, that, that are real that are not accepted scientifically and that we do not understand yet. So with that warning, um, fortunately I did have it. So uh, when Paul Pantone called, I wasn't too surprised when he said, well, he had an engine and it runs on virtually everything. And um, uh, he said he, he put beer into the tank and it ran so hot that it almost glowed in the dark. And I kind of thought, oh yes, how much did he have himself? <laughs> but we, we, we kept contacts. And um, then in 95, I was actually invited to his home and uh, see that engine. And I was, I was convinced there had to be some reasonable explanation that the scientist can accept that uh, would explain why it runs. So uh, that's, that was uh, the next step when I met those people. Well, uh, Paul and an employee of his, they actually completely disassembled such an engine. They cleaned and oiled everything and put it back together in front of my eyes. And then they put in a crazy mixture of Oh, what was it? I think paint thin, uh, uh, dish, uh, dish water detergent, uh, salt water, um, a, a really silly mixture. And you know what? It started on first attempt. And I just kind of, uh, I was very much surprised. Uh, there was no camera present. However, an art student at our college uh, created this conception here. And I think it, um, it kind of looks a little bit like me. And I think the facial expression was very much the same. It's just kind of, you know, this works. OK. So and I must say, to this day, I don't have an explanation of why it works. Uh, personally, I think we'll need 20 or 50 years to find out how this machine really works. That's my guess, 20 years at least. Um, because we do not have the physics to explain um, why it works. I, I'd be willing to bet the best and biggest bars with chocolate with anyone, OK? <laughs> then not only did it work, but we also tested it on the load. And any one of you who is into engines, uh, this is a neat little trick to test the power output of an engine. You attach a rope to the ceiling. You wind it once around the wheel. And at the end of the rope, you hang a weight. Now, the only thing you have to watch out for, this wheel has to rotate such as to lift the weight, not the other way around. Otherwise, you're going to have an accident. Okay? You're going to have something drastic happen in your laboratory or your garage. Something is going to get ripped apart. Anyway, so if you know the radius and you know the weight, and you know the RPMs, then it's a simple formula to compute the power in horsepower. And this number here will change a little bit. It's 63,000 and some. If you are going for American horsepower, uh, it's 63,300 and some for European horsepower. The European horsepower is a little bit smaller because it's defined by 75 meter kilogram per second, while the American horsepower is defined as 550 uh, foot pounds per second. Uh, they, they come fairly close. One is for a 745 watt, and the other one is equivalent to 736 watts. So, um, so it, it's a very simple formula, and you can test virtually any motor on how much power it will give you. 
Uh, I learned this trick from a salesman who used to sell uh, electrical motors and he had been accused of selling the wrong machine and that was the trick that he used to prove that it was the right motor that he sold. All right, so we tested the output of that engine and we got to about uh, two horsepower and unfortunately the wheel was not centered and balanced enough. It, it rattled something loose in inside the engine and we had to abort uh, the test. However, we did have actual power and that engine didn't even blink. It just kept on running. Uh, so the, the power is really there. So I went then home and here comes a historic moment. I went home and wrote the letter, put my name and my title under it, essentially uh, to whom it concerns, it works, and my signature. And uh, that has been the big opening break, essentially, for Paul Pantone and Molly Pantone. Uh, after I was willing to put my name on a piece of paper, uh, uh, a bunch of other PhDs were willing to do the same. And from then on, uh, it, it gradually grew uh, more and more academics were willing to accept the fact that we had something there that really works and that was worthwhile to do research in. And so with that, I come to the last foil, uh, second to last. What I would like to be doing, I, I have hopes to be working for the GEET company, uh, the sooner the better. Um, it's always an inspiring thing to work with Paul and Molly. They're people that make you feel good, they're reasonable, and what, what they want me to do makes sense. I have experienced in large corporations plenty of bosses. I struggled to do my very best, and they only wanted more. And the, the result was I was completely strung out. It ended to fights and po uh, power games and all of that. So. I really look forward to working for Paul and Molly. And uh, the particular things I would really like to do is, for one thing, I want to have a serious chemical analysis of whatever fuel we're using in whichever experiment. I want to have that absolutely clear, what goes in beyond a doubt, and I want to have it documented in such a way that scientists and engineers can accept it. Then, uh, of course, all the tests I want to run under load. Unless we are loading that engine, it is, it is, doing performing, it is performing work, uh, the test isn't worth much. I mean, who wants to have an idling engine? Uh, you would rather turn it off so it doesn't make noise. Uh, so if an engine is running, it has to do work. And so I want all of the tests under load. The third thing I want to do is I want to do chemical analysis of the gas mixtures and va vapors at various points inside the engine from the intake to, to various times in the compression and expansion cycle of the cylinder. I want it again at the exhaust, maybe several points in the exhaust. I want to know exactly what substances we have here because I have seen uh, indications that we may have uh, transmutations. Uh, in other words, transmutations of elements. That is something that for the scientific world is rather hard to grasp. Um, you have the benefit, you don't have a PhD. Uh, for, for you, you, you don't see the big, oh gosh, you know, it, it does not, um, how shall I say, turn upside down everything you've learned for 30 years and that sort of a thing. For me, it does. So I want to have the gas mixture analyzed at many different points, and I also want to know the temperature of that gas mixture at many different times, at many different locations. Then the next one here, that's a mysterious one. For some reason, 
they are electrical and magnetic fields around the reactor of that engine. And I have no idea why. I mean, imagine you had electrical or magnetic fields around the carburetor. Why would there be electrical or magnetic fields? Yeah. I don't know. That would be one of the things I would want to look at. Yes. Well, she, she was wondering whether they were pulsed or periodic or dynamic. That's possible. Well, anyway, I, I would want to look at these fields, let's say, with an oscilloscope to see the time behavior. And definitely a spectrum analyzer so I can tell are there definite frequencies or is it just a noise band or something of that sort. That is correct, yes. As a matter of fact, I have heard that there is a possibility that if you draw energy from these fields, you may actually get more energy out of that engine than from the shaft of, uh, from the intended output. So there's lots of worthwhile to look into there. And then the radiation. Um, when six years ago when I saw some scribblings that someone from a ga with a gas chromatograph had uh, done. It showed that at some point there was helium in the mixture, although, you know, wh when you have dishwater, oils, uh, salt water, and, and things, and air going in, where, wh where should that helium come from? So I thought, well, in case there's a nuclear reaction, that helium could come from lots of alpha particles. And I did some back of the envelope uh, computation. And the energy, uh, the power that that would have liberated, it would have melted down the city block. So uh, it was clear to me that something else had to go on. However, uh, from Seattle on the phone, I, I advised Paul Pantone to, to uh, to, to look into that radiation, and it dawned on me that probably the simplest for the layman is to buy medical x-ray film, put it around the engine, and let that engine run. And um, I, you, you may already know the story. All these uh, films all were exposed. They were all black, uh, except one or two. One had a teeny little emblem on a piece of pipe was magnified largely on that medical x-ray film. So that indicates it comes from a very, very sharp, small point. But what that point is and what it's doing, I have no idea. Yes? That may, that's someone, something I haven't yet uh, thought of. But, yeah, yeah, mechanical vibrations, yes. That, that would be easy enough to do, some kind of a microphone and hook that up to the spectrum analyze and see what that uh, gives you, yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What frequency would that be? Uh, 40 kilohertz? Oh, okay. Uh, wait a minute, are you talking about temperature or uh, mechanical resonance? Mm hmm, mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll remember that. Yeah. And then, of course, the last item, hopefully, would be to write the missing chapter into the physics book. And, of course, my one of those gifted art students, this is what he came up with as a future, uh, yeah, something like 20 years down the road, I would have, obviously, quite a bit fewer hair on my head than now, and uh, you probably can't see, but it says here the Richter principle. 
So <laughs> I, would, I would be very lucky if that principle would be named in my uh, name, but anyway, we can always dream. So this is what I have. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, no, I do not. For practical reasons, I don't want to fix my own car, okay? If, if I drive a car with the GEETS device into my uh, repair station, they're going to go, what is this, okay? Um, I'm, not, I'm neither rich in money nor time, but time is more precious to me. So I don't want to crawl under the cars and fix it. I'd much rather pay a few bucks to someone else to do that for me. However, I, I can see in the future to have one. If I get involved with the uh, GEET and I would be around people who know what to do with that car, I'll probably drive one like that. No, I never have. Because I lived far away from GEET. I, I lived in Seattle while GEET is uh, located in uh, Salt Lake City. be honest you would have to call uh, you would have to ask uh, Paul Pantone I, th I think he sold quite a few uh, kits of conversion he has converted some his uh, I don't know how many he did that would be something I think he's downstairs right now if you want to oh then why do you ask me <laughs> oh I see okay all right uh, anything else? Well, if not, then thank you very much for listening. <laughs>